<laughs> Hello, my name is Alex Dyer. I'm a Canon Ordinary here for the Episcopal Church in Colorado. And we're picking up against again with our Canon Conversations. And today I have a member of the clergy of the cathedral, our cathedral, and I will allow her to introduce herself, Katie. Sure, I'm Katie Pearson. I am Canon Pastor at St. John's Cathedral in Denver. And I have been in that position for about three years. Um, super grateful to have had time to do my job pre-COVID and develop some relationships. And, and I am uh, really um, holding all of those who are trying to do pastoral care and get to know their communities when they're new, particularly in prayer during this time. Thank you, Katie. So. And for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, St. John in the Wilderness, about how many members do you have? You know, we have, uh, like most Episcopal churches, we have far more people on our books than we actually have showing up on a regular Sunday, but our average Sunday attendance is usually upwards of 600 across three services and um, a variety of offerings. Mm -hmm. so. so a very large uh, setting to deal with uh, and yeah. a lot of stuff. So pastoral care, I'm sure it looks different than you do does a lot of our congregations here across Colorado. That being said, I think there are some things perhaps you can offer to us or we can have a conversation about what pastoral care looks like in the age of COVID. Mm. Uh, so I was wondering if you could offer any insights you've had just generally on how it looks a little <laughs> bit different in the age of COVID when we had to switch on a dime or just turn on a dime and do things dramatically different. So I suspect it looks very different say than it did in March, but over yes. these uh, past couple months, what have you learned and what are you learning now? Uh, well, I'm learning new things every day, that's for sure, and uh, often um, trial by error. Um, so I think that um, one of the gifts of St. John's is while we are a cathedral and um, you know, host ordinations and uh, the bishop's consecration ordination and all of these um, things for the entire diocese. Um, we really spend 95% of our time as a parish. Mm -hmm. And, um, and St. John's has a very steady, uh, constant um, um, group of parishioners who come and call it home. So in many ways, while we're a larger scale and we do things that other churches, other parishes don't do, we, we live into a lot of the same realities that mm -hmm. smaller parishes do. Um, I actually have always considered it one of the gifts of my um, ordained life that I had 25 years as a really active lay person preceding my ordination. And I particularly feel that way during COVID. Um, it has been an opportunity to live into all of the things that I loved as a lay person and lift up and empower our laity to step in in ways that they haven't always, um, particularly in pastoral care. After I told you the numbers we have at St. John's, there is no way that Richard Broderick and I could meet the pastoral needs of that many folks, um, particularly during a pandemic. So there are a couple things that have worked really well for us. Um, some of them are uh, leaning back on things that are as old as the early church, and some are, are very, very new. So we have fortunately started a program called Community Without the Commute about a year and a half ago. So a full year pre-pandemic and started to try to figure out how our folks could connect in small groups geographically. And that has been great for us to call on because we have parishioners who drive um, an hour plus um, during normal times to come worship at the cathedral and participate in activities so learning who else lives near them has been a real gift, particularly during this time. So we have folks who are gathering in groups up to 10 um, on their lawns, uh, in a park that's nearby, masked, socially distanced, following all those protocols. But that has been really helpful. And, and that is completely lay driven. Um, we are not 
other than advertising, um, St. John's doesn't try to, we're not coming at it from a top-down perspective at all. And that's been great. Um, the, so really hearkening back to sort of those um, home churches mm. from, from our earliest days as Christians. Um, and I think that will come more and more uh, the longer this goes on. The other thing that a lot of smaller churches probably do that we had not engaged in in a long time was a good old fashioned phone tree. Mm -hmm. um, I collected about 50 volunteers who took 10 to 15 names each and just started calling. And it's funny because as you can imagine, Alex, some people's impression was, oh, is this stewardship? And it was like, no, uh, that starts later. Um, but we called it stewardship of relationship and really just checking in. How can we pray for you? How can we be present to you? Are you connected to the cathedral? And we learned a lot from that. And one was that some of our folks weren't aware of the best ways to, to stay connected with us. Um, and so that just gave us a lot of information. And again, you know, organization came from, from me and from staff, but it was completely um, lay led. And it was really powerful, both for those who were called and those who were doing the calling. Mm. Um, I think that um, we've really lived into the notion of sharing the care, that our people are taking care of each other. Another um, thing we started right away was um, polled clergy, staff, other lay leaders to figure out who our most isolated folks were who doesn't have family, not just the people who were on our EV list, but even those that we knew that Sunday worship and the activities at the church were their main social um, connection and their main um, way of, of having needs met. And so had our people um, come up with a list and basically we adopted parishioners. I mm -hmm. connected those who wanted to be in touch and so weekly phone calls are made to our folks who don't have family nearby or live alone yeah. and um and that's been really really fruitful so i would say the greatest gift to me as canon pastor that will extend far beyond um this time is really leaning into lifting up our lay leaders and lay involvement so a lot of stuff i know for just clergy or anybody that does pastoral care a lot of stuff happens on sundays when we were gathered together yeah yeah in yeah. that coffee hour moment yeah. uh, or uh you know on the way out to church or just kind of what could seem as a very small moment the interpersonal stuff where somebody tells you something or or your sixth sense kind of gets initiated you're kind of like something's going on here that that i need to uh investigate um, or at least oh, that moment at the altar rail mm -hmm. when you look into someone's eyes and you're just like, wow, we need to catch up. Yeah, that is that kind of connection or um, so many you and so many of the folks who will, will hear this have been to St. John's for a variety of reasons. And I will tell you, conversations always happen outside the bathrooms. <laughs> that that main yeah, hallway that. yeah oh yeah there's always a crowd and and people you know waiting for someone else who's in the bathroom and you I've had a lot of deep pastoral conversations outside the bathrooms at St. John's and um and I yeah I I miss that terribly and that is a very hard thing to replicate um so if you've got an answer yeah. if you've got an answer alex I, I i i don't have an answer i mean i think we we lose some stuff with masks we lose some stuff with yeah. zoom uh you know there there's it's hard to replace that yeah. personal kind of thing too in some ways i think people are reaching out from what i hear to more people on a more yeah. regular basis via phone or whatever too so yeah. that's nice um so there's more of a chance of Picking up on that, oh, we need to talk. Hopefully you're talking more uh, right. about that. Um, I do think, thank goodness, when we you know, finally were able to enter season two, felt a little bit more comfortable as time has gone on, having some one-on-one, -on -one, um, socially distanced, mm -hmm. masked um, pastoral meetings. I live not far from Cheeseman Park, and I have um, gone on walks with a number of parishioners. And, and those in some ways are actually more, those encounters are more intimate and very different than what I would do 
Mm -hmm. um, during regular time. So it hasn't all been bad. It just hasn't been very easy. And I think that's, yeah. that's what I miss is just those spontaneous things. Every single thing I do now is scheduled everything. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of opportunity for spontaneity. That is true. Spontaneity is something that seems to be a distant memory in some ways, but I think our, our yeah. priorities have shifted a little bit. You know, I'm not in parish mm -hmm. ministry, but it seems to me that priorities have shifted a little bit. Yeah. Uh, as far as time and energy or whatnot, we are kind of reaching, you know, we are having walks with people, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and making mm -hmm. that more, I guess, more intentional uh, about that. Right. Right. Uh, letting go of some of the other stuff, hopefully, as well. I, I hope so. And I think um, the thing that I find, both for my own well being and ultimately for our people's well being, is just constantly reminding myself and others that we just need to slow down. Mm. We cannot. We cannot replace one for one what we used to do with Zoom or mm -hmm. something. We. we I think at the very beginning of this, there was sort of this frenetic energy around, well, we need to do this and this and this and this and this. Yeah. And I almost feel like now that we're entering the program year for, you know, most of us, um, I, I feel that creeping back in and I'm, I, I'm nervous about that. I'm nervous about it for our clergy. I'm nervous about it for our people. Um, and I, I just hope that we can just slow down a little bit um, because I think we'll all benefit greatly from it. It, it makes us more intentional. It makes us more thoughtful. It makes us more aware of, um, you know, all of the things that are around us. And um, I mean, my goodness, this election season, um, mm -hmm. holy cow, we just all need to be gentle <laughs> with ourselves. Well, and circling back to around, I mean, you may not, experiences but but i can and i do and i know maybe some of my colleagues the idea of uh, perfectionism and control i mean you may be not, not in the same category but no uh, i have none of that in me. None of that, none no, of those no, no control issues at all yes uh well I don't well, ask my family that <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> some of our colleagues do myself included and that they, you mm. know and i think me having to let go of that more of that control or that perfectionism and rely more yeah. on progress or yeah. it being slightly imperfect and and the, yeah. you know, i'm not doing worship but gosh i know i would have had to let go of some of the the preciousness uh yeah. of, of worship that i used to relish in the sense yeah. that things had to be perfect and things had to kind of yeah. be this way and it gives me a false sense of of control uh, yeah. around things and i think that's all been eroded and we're all having <laughs> no matter what whether you're ordained or not mm -hmm. right your world i suspect is imperfect and the cracks are being exposed probably even more than what you are usually accustomed to. Well, and we're getting ready to do a, a two part series um, where I'll be like this in conversation with um, this really um, fabulous woman named Hope Carwile. And um, we've done it. We've partnered with her for a couple of other things. And, and our whole, the whole premise of our, our conversations is going to be around grief. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this, we are swimming in grief yes. and, and we are all experiencing so many kinds of loss. And, um, and I think we were more aware of that at the beginning because, you know, I know my youngest son's college graduation was, he, he likes to say he graduated from our basement. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, Mother's Day, I mean, all of these things that were early on and the weddings that, you know, m many of us were going to officiate the summer and got, you know, things got dressed. I think we were more aware of how things were being lost early. Mm -hmm. and, and we've sort of, we think we've gotten used to that, but I don't think we've gotten used to it at all. Mm -hmm. And, and I think pastorally, I enter every conversation during this time, really listening for that loss and yeah. that grief that, that I don't know that everyone could even name that way. Um, and, and I just, I don't think we can forget that. Yeah. Um, and in some ways it sounds awkward, but I don't, I don't think we should in the sense of, no. yeah. In the sense of, yeah, just, I mean, if we got to a point to where 
grief became normalized. And that was this right. part of things like that's, that's a right. scary place to be, I think. Oh, you know, absolutely. So, though I don't wish grief on anyone or, uh, un, un, you know, that kind of deep grief. I mean, the reality is it's there. And, and I think we talked about it, uh, uh, the leadership meeting, I think two weeks ago, where we're talking about this ambiguous grief, this kind of continued grief that just extends uh, that is a part of it. As a as, uh, woman said on there, her, uh, the deacon said that, you know, she was in Katrina when they came out and they said, you know, talked about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. She goes, there's nothing post about it. And that comment kind of resonated with me. It's just this constant kind of like, oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, all the transitions, people retiring or mm -hmm. whatever too, they're just, we crave this normalcy or crave to be back, but the reality is whatever we do is going to fall woefully short if we want to stay safe. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. that's, that just doesn't seem right. doesn't yeah. seem fair. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah. I hope, I hope, um, I hope we do better. I hope we do better pastoral care by having that at the forefront when yep. we encounter our folks wherever we're encountering them, not in the hallway outside the bathroom, but whether it's on Zoom or a walk or that we just really are, are attuned to that and, and listening for that loss. And for you, Alex, it might be the loss of the illusion of control. <laughs> I seem to, it seems to be over and over again. Uh, a little bit more profound maybe than normal, but it seems a lesson I have to learn over and over again, unfortunately. Maybe yeah, one, day, you, one day it'll you, stick. You, you keep working on that friend. I will. I will. Well, well, thank you for your time and thank you for Absolutely. raising up lay people as well too. I think that's an important yeah. thing. I think sometimes um, yeah. we're having to reevaluate what church looks like and what ministry looks like. Uh, you know, and the reality is it should always look like this. I mean, really, yeah. it, it should always look like lay folks being supported by their clergy and, and um, you know, I like to say that those folks were there long before I got there and God willing, they're going to be there long after I leave St. John's and mm. I am there to help them make St. John's the place that they need and want it to be. And that's the way it should always be. Why do we need something like this to remind us of that? Mm. Um, and it's also, it, it keeps us healthy. And I think that's a really important thing to remember that I, I think we can get into this mindset of we have to do everything. And, um, and, and we don't, and we shouldn't. Um, and maybe that's one of the, maybe that's one of the enduring lessons of this time, if we're lucky. I hope so. I hope some of that stuff yeah. does actually stick uh, yeah. and makes us a better church on the other end. Well, thank you for your time, Katie. Thank you. It's always fun to talk to you, Alex, about <laughs> all sorts of things. <laughs> all right. Well, again, thank you for your time. Take care. Absolutely. Bye-bye.